All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 1 to 14. I uh, need to put you in remembrance of things, and I, I, for those of you who come every week, I know you get tired of these reviews, but I'm trying to make sure we're always on the same page with this. And some of you missed through the summer, it's good to catch up. We're in a section here where Paul is answering questions. Do you recall this? Paul mentioned he received a letter from a group of people at the church at Corinth, and they had a series of questions they wanted to ask him about what they needed to do to get things right. Uh, I know as we look at the Corinthian church, our first thought of this church is just a mess. We, that's how we think of it. But I want you to remember that there was a group there in the midst of all this sin and all the things that are going on and all the mistakes this church is making. There's a group there that is looking to get it right. There's a group there that really wants to get on the right track with God. And they've come up with ideas and ways to try to do this. And they're running it past Paul. Now, admittedly, as we found, their ideas may not be the best list that ever came along, and we find there's a lot of flaws in it, but they're trying to move in the right direction. And Paul has been trying to answer these questions and deal with these things, and if you recall, the last thing we dealt with was a big question they asked about something. Remember what that was? No one remembers what that is. Why we review every week? Because you can't answer these simple and basic questions. What was it that they were struggling with? There was a group there that didn't want them to do something. Marriage and sexuality was just before that, so there, there. But the one right after that was dealing with meat. Sacrifice, Sacrifice to idols. I knew I could get it out of here. We tried it long enough. That's it. That's an issue of food. Meat sacrificed to idols. They were looking at this, and they said, we don't want to be involved in this old pagan worship. As we said, the culture was a mess around them. And Corinth was a mess in the mess. As we said, Corinth was so bad, the rest of the corrupt Roman Empire looked at it and said, you guys are awful. <laughs> so when the rest of the corrupt people think you're bad, things are pretty bad. <laughs> and they're dealing with this, and they're looking at this, and Paul has gone through this and said, here you have a thing. You remember what their charge was? They go, we are trying to get past this nonsense. Now, let me put something out to you. I have found there are two aspects of a sinful culture. And I think we should relate pretty well to Corinth because if there was ever a time when we're, people are stuck in a sinful culture. I, I know Dr. MacArthur just did a, a sermon talking about that he believed America is coming under a time of judgment. And I can see why. There are two aspects to sin that I've run into. And, and one is the sinfulness of it, the perversion of it. The other is, the, frankly, the silliness. There's two sides to this. On the one hand, we have this perverse culture. Now, I don't know if you've been watching this and what's going on now, but uh, our federal government has announced a new website. And on this website, and it was announced by a gentleman who wears a dress and acts in our Surgeon General's office, and this guy, and I'm not gonna use his preferred pronouns, I'm sorry, this guy is saying we have this website to help children. We're gonna help children who need to transition. And if you go and check this website out, one of the things they do on there is tell young children who want to look at other gender possibilities, how to get around school, state laws, and their parents to do so. All right. So our federal government is literally funding ways to keep parents uninvolved with this issue of their children. So now I want you to understand, this gentleman in a dress is a doctor, a pediatrician, who's looking after the nature of children, who is trying to push a sin that just five years ago was seen as a mental illness. And we, you look at these things, you go, these people are monsters. When you are setting up a desire to pervert an entire generation, that's a monster. That is a disgusting aspect. And in the Corinth, they are looking at their culture, and there are monsters out there. There are people that are perverting a culture on a grand level. Now, on the flip side of that, there's also silliness. I don't know if you've noticed this, but people that get in this vault have also some of the dumbest things. On the one hand, you go, these are monsters. And the other guys, you just go, these people are idiots. <laughs> I got to I'll watch a film of a convention. It's a convention that's being held. And this convention, is its goal is to help the culture wake up and become more sensitive about things. And one of the rules they set at the convention, there will be no clapping. Somebody clap at that? <laughs> You're not allowed to. Here's what they decide. They will have glad hands. You know what glad hands are? That's right. Whenever you hear something you like and whenever something comes up that you are positive about, we will not allow clapping. It'll be glad hands. You know why they didn't allow clapping? Violence. It was violent. People were traumatized by the violence of clapping. Oh, that was just a guess. You are dead on. 
and then you look at this, on the one hand, you're going, these are monsters perverting a generation. On the other hand, you look, you go, these people are idiots. This is just insanity. Now, I, I point that out because I want you to put yourself in the mindset of these people that approach Paul because they're seeing these two problems, not just in the culture, but in the church. Because has the church had a sense of doing some things that are just silly as well? And here's what I found. The church wants to avoid the perversion of the culture, and we looked, we talked about these. We set rules that do not exist in the book. Remember some of those? No dancing. No playing cards. We do not play cards. Cards are the devil's tools. Yeah, that's right. Uno's terrible. Yeah. <laughs> these are things you have. And, and playing a game like spoons, there's violence for you again. You know, you know, you know, you know, cards. Draw blood. Oh, ah, there are some cards. War. There's a game of war. There's some terrible things with cards. It is amazing to me that the church, on the one hand, will tolerate gross doctrinal error while believing that they are doing some kind of a favor by coming up with silly rules to prevent sin. I've run into churches that will not let you drink coffee because of caffeine addiction. Amen. And they have some other twisted views on things. Uh, <laughs> Too close to home. There, there's, there's, there are churches out there that to this day will tell you you cannot read any Bible except the King James Version. Okay? They say why? Anybody have heard the argument? John carried it. Yeah. yeah. Some people believe that disciples can go back. But the biggest one I've heard is this, because it's the only authorized Version. Now, do you know who authorized the King James Version? King James. King James, who was not a Christian, nor a theologian, and was, quite frankly, a perverse man in his life. And somehow, that's the authorized thing. I, I, I point this out because we have this tendency to focus on silly things rather than what matters. Now, all of this to tell you this. Paul has just confronted this whole issue. They've been saying, here it is. People in this church are telling us they can't, we can't eat meat sacrificed to idols, are telling us this is an evil thing, and we've looked at this, and we found three reasons they're wrong. Now, judging how you dealt with the last few questions, I'm not going to ask anybody to come up with the three reasons, because I don't want to be disappointed again. <laughs> but here's the three reasons they said. One, we can't find any place in Scripture where it says that. God never said you can't eat meat sacrificed to idols, right? Okay. Now that I've started, anybody want to try one of the other two? God does not exist. It's an idol. There's nothing there. It's wood, stone, metal. There's no real spiritual power in this. You have nothing to worry about. An idol is a dead thing. Remember we talked about, we looked at Old Testament passages that dealt with that, that said, you know, how, how can you make a god with human hands? How can you take a piece of wood that you'd make a coffee table out of and do it in this form and suddenly it's a god? Give me a break, this is nonsense. And then there was one last one that said this, and God no longer has dietary laws. God doesn't care what you eat. Spirituality is not dependent on whether you do or do not eat certain things. All of this stuff is out the window. So they're saying, here's our problem. We can't find any real reason not to do this. This is silly. This is nonsense. And Paul, if you recall, went through and said, yep, all three of those are perfectly correct reasons. It is a sign of immaturity. There are no rules against it. You are free to eat meat sacrifice or idols. And then he said to do what? Don't do it. Don't do it. <laughs> Why? Don't cause people to stumble. Don't cause people to stumble. He goes, here's the thing. Yes, it's a sign of immaturity, but the fact is we have immature Christians. And here's the other reality. Some people struggle with things you don't. You look at this and you know that there's no issue to this. They're not there yet. Remember he said, not everybody knows this. Not everybody gets this. Not everybody understands. You have to be careful about this. Not that you want them to stay in that state forever. Remember, this book is written and he says, this is immaturity and there is no, there is nothing to these idols. Who is going to read this book? Everyone. Everyone. The ones who said don't eat meat to sacrifice to idols and those who said it is nonsense. He's, the same people are going to read it. He's not coddling anybody. Paul is not saying, let's go along and change our doctrine to accommodate them. We all know it's wrong, but let's pretend it's true. Remember I used the example of the child with the nightlight. You turn on the nightlight, 
Is, does that really change what's in the darkness? Does that really make them safer? No, it doesn't, but does it help them sleep? Yes. There's a big difference between turning in the nightlight and telling there really are monsters in the closet. Those are two big different things. So Paul is saying some people need to protect themselves in ways you don't understand. Some people are immature and need a chance to grow, and you need to accommodate that. Now, Paul has made this statement. He's laid it out. And if you remember how he ended that, verse 13 of the last chapter. Therefore, if what I eat causes my brother to fall into sin, I will never eat meat again. Now, I want you to understand the Greek doesn't have the word meat. Paul literally says, I'll never eat again. Now, we, we assume he means I'll never eat meat again. But Paul might be doing a superlative over the top statement. You know, if I have to starve to death to keep my fellow brother from sinning, I'll do that. Now, that would settle the issue. The apostle has spoken. He's explained it logically. And, of course, you know, when you explain something logically and you lay out the reasons for it, people immediately go, yes, we get it, and it never comes up again. <laughs> That's been your experience? And that's so nice when that happens. It would be nice if that would ever happen. Yes. <laughs> and sometimes it does. But here's what Paul recognizes. I've explained it, but I know there's going to be an undercurrent here. I know that a couple of things are going to happen. Here's the first thing that's going to happen. People are going to look at this and go, it's easy for you, Paul, to send us these rules. You wrote it. You don't have to live here. You don't have to be the one that doesn't get to eat the meat offered to idols. You're not the one that has to deal with this. You can tell us one thing, but that's easy for you to say, you don't have to do that. Why should we have to if you don't have to live with those same things? There's another problem. And I think this goes to a more basic issue. That's what's going on here. There's a response that he's anticipating because people have a certain thing that drives them. Now, I don't know if you've been watching all of the stuff as we're building up to the midterm elections, but. I've been uh, called by pollsters at least a dozen times in the last month and a half. I get calls all the time. Will you answer a few questions? It's never a few questions. <laughs> I ask for the starting, how long will this take? And they'll have to honestly, well, about 20 minutes. Uh, well, yeah, I've got the time or I don't, but I, I don't mind. And the polls are going on. Now, if you're watching the political fervor out there, people are telling us there are things that should drive our vote. One of the things we're told that should drive our vote is the Roe v. Wade overturning by the Supreme Court. If you're on the pro-life side, if you're on God's side of this thing, we are told we can't really afford to let another group get in there that's going to pack the court and overturn this thing and take us back to the old ways. If you're on the opposite side of that, you can't afford to let a Republican get in there and put any more wild and crazy judges in there that see life as valuable. we got to do something to stop that. Gun control. We're told this is something of a shit. We see all these shootings going on. People are going wild. Who would have thought that would happen when you put a, cr a craziness into a generation? There it is. And we're told that should drive us. Uh, the culture wars, we're told. But poll after poll is told one thing that is driving, overwhelmingly driving, most voters coming up in November. You know what that is? Economy. The economy. The economy. Most voters are going, you know what? $100 each time I fill the car is getting a little tough. And that's only half a tank. <laughs> yeah, I had to take a loan out last week to fill the car. It's crazy. It's crazy. You look at the price of milk, eggs, bread, but the, the basic commodities of life are not just a little higher. I know we're saying now that inflation is about 9.1%, but the actual cost in goods that we buy in the groceries are much, much higher. Some of those are up 30, 40, 50%. And their availability is way down. So most people vote the economy, quite frankly. If you remember in the Clinton era, they had a saying that went with their thing. It's the economy, stupid. That's the thing that people tend to vote on. Well, here's what Paul understands now. One, they're going to be looking at this and going, you're imposing a rule you don't have to live by. We don't care for that. And two, and more importantly to them, this is going to cost me money. Why is it going to cost them money? Remember how we served that? Buy more expensive meat. Yeah, why was it cheaper to buy meat sacrificed to idols? Because they got more free. Yeah. It was given to the priest. They can't eat it all. And they can't eat it all. And now they sell it. They have no overhead. They don't have to pay to stay in the temple. They didn't have to pay for the meat. So now, who has the best buy in town on spare ribs? Okay? They're trying to bless the people. You know? <laughs> so here's their argument. He, they go, Paul... Being sensitive is one thing, but this is going to be expensive. 
this is not fair. You don't have to live under these rules. Why should we? Now, this is what Paul is going to answer here in chapter 9. Now, I want you to understand what Paul is going to do. The first thing Paul is going to say was, guess what? As a matter of fact, I do live under this rule, and I do it to a far greater extent than you do. And let me explain how that works, he says. I'm an apostle, and an apostle has a right to expect something. A man who has been set aside by God to live his life full time in the service of God has a right to expect something. You know what he has a right to expect? A living. He expects that the church has a responsibility to pay his way. Have you noticed what Paul does for a living? He's a tent maker. Most that's what he does. Lord, the word literally means leather worker. And tents were one of the bigger items they made out of animal skins, but he's a leather worker. And he has to do that full time to pay his way. And Paul is now going to come back and say, here's why that's going on. And this is something you need to do. You gave me three reasons why this is silly and you shouldn't have to put up with it. Let me give you six reasons why this is silly and I shouldn't have to put up with it. And then let me tell you why I do. And let's see if you understand why it is I can put this rule out for you because I live under it for me. Now, here's how he starts. Let me take this apart for you. Am I not free? Now, that's where he starts. Now, why does he start there? Yeah. This is their argument. Are we not free not to have to live by these silly rules? An, an idol is nothing. Dietary laws don't matter. These things, there's no rule about it. Am I not free from these petty, silly rules? And now Paul goes, now, you've been saying you're free. Am I free? Am I, am I, do I get to play that category too? Am I a person who's free in Christ to expect certain things, to expect certain freedoms? And what is the answer, of course? Yes. yes. And then he makes his case. Here's his first reason. Why is it that I should expect you to take care of me? Am I not an apostle? Now, I want you to understand, this is a very simple statement. But the apostles were held in very high regard in the early church. This is a time when most of them are still alive, especially one guy who's immensely popular as an apostle. Who that is? Peter. Peter. Why is Peter so popular? Cornerstone. He, he's the big name. He's the corner. This is the guy that all the stories are tell, told about. He's a people person. He, and he's also a people. P Peter, people like Peter. The apostles liked Peter. They made him the honorary head of the apostles. They followed Peter because everybody likes Peter. As a matter of fact, Peter has never really ministered in any depth at first in the Corinthian church. But you remember when they said who they divided over, who were following? I'm a follower. Remember one of the names that came up? Peter. Peter. Well, how can you be so devoted to a guy who's not a pastor here and has never spent any time here? Because he was so immensely popular. You read a book. Yeah, read a book. <laughs> but here's the thing they also understood. All of the other apostles, the church paid their way. The church had always paid their way. Except for one guy. Paul. Paul. He's the only apostle that the church is not paying the way for. Now, why did Paul run into such a problem? What was it that was different about Paul? We didn't want to be paid. Yeah, that's the biggie, but before that, there was another one. What? Yeah, I was out of time. I'm the apostle that was added kind of late in the game. Now, there's the biggest problem. Who disliked Paul? Pretty much everybody, okay? The Jews hated him because he was a traitor to the faith. He turned into a Christian. The Christian hated him and didn't like him and didn't trust him because he killed, him. He killed Christians. It's kind of hard to give to the account when you killed my brother or my mother. You know, yeah, you want to help to support Paul? Not really. No, no, not so much. Paul is not popular. Paul has this issue. But he, and he mentions it here. Am I not an apostle? Now, he gives some credentials. Do you remember what it took to become an apostle? Okay. Two things. Two, two critical things. The, the other apostles made it a standard that you had to have been with Christ when he was on earth. But the thing that God made were two. One, you had to be personally commissioned by Jesus Christ. And two, you had to have seen the risen Christ. 
you had to see the physical risen Christ in your life. This was required. And Paul says, am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Now, wait a minute. Jesus had already died. How did he do that? On the Damascus Road, what happened? The glory of God showed, the glorified Jesus appeared to him and said, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Remember that? Mm -hmm. A rather dramatic moment. Unique. This is a big deal. And Paul is saying, you know that. You know the story. And as a matter of fact, Paul could appeal to something here because who verified that Paul was an apostle? Peter. Peter. <laughs> you like Peter so much, Pete's my guy. He says, I'm in here. He didn't dispute it. Why should you? I saw the risen Lord. Now, I want to pause and just put it aside here. I hear a lot of people make claims about seeing a risen Jesus. There's one pastor like, that used to talk about how it was that regularly Jesus would appear in his bathroom mirror when he was shaving, and they would talk in the morning, and God, he'd give directions from Jesus for his day. Now, I'm sorry, but biblically, Jesus didn't do that kind of stuff. He was very particular about when he showed himself in his risen form. He did it to, one, establish that he had come back from the grave, and he did it to establish the people he was going to commission to serve him. But he didn't do it all the time, or else why would Paul say this is a big deal for me to have seen the risen Lord? If everybody's doing it, if he's in all your bathroom mirrors, it's a little hard <laughs> to see this as a critical difference. Jesus doesn't do that kind of stuff. But he says here, he did it for me. And now he makes a bigger one. Are you not the result of my work in the Lord? Even though I may not be an apostle to others, surely I am to you. Now here he's saying, I know there's critics out there saying I don't deserve to be an apostle. There are those that say you were persecuted the church, you don't deserve it. There are those that say you, you weren't with the original 12, you don't deserve to be here. Uh, there's the Judaizers that hate him for turning on the Jewish faith, and they are trying to discredit him every place he goes. And there are those who question Paul's authority. But Paul says, we got past that. How does he know they got past that? There's a church there because of whose work? Paul's. So you must have accepted that I was sent by God or we wouldn't be having this conversation. Clearly, I am an apostle to you. You get it. You believe it. We're right on this one. For you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. You, you remember what a seal was in the ancient world? Some of you may remember this. You remember sealing wax when you did this, uh, an envelope? It was a sign of authority. It was a sign of authenticity. If I was going to send something and you had to know it really came from me, it would have my signet seal. And that was a big deal. That signet would, went from father to son. It stayed within the family. You made sure that no one else got access to that. Uh, when you sent goods, if you wanted to know it really came from this, if the government, the Roman government was going to say this is an approved item, we're, we're sanctioning this, a Roman seal would be placed on it. And Paul is saying this. The proof of my apostleship comes out in this. The churches I founded, like you, prove my authenticity. God has shown his work through me. Things have changed in your life because I must actually be an apostle. Verse 3, this is my defense to those who sit in judgment on me. This is his thing. The people that try to say it isn't true, he points and says, but look what God has done. You have an issue? Don't take it up with me. Talk to Jesus and see how it goes. That's his challenge. Now, he says, I'm an apostle, and their complaint is our grocery bill is going to go up. Look at Paul's challenge in verse 4. Do I have the right to food and drink? Now, you see how he's escalated things here? He's digging the knife a little bit. He goes, you're complaining about an increased grocery bill. I'm asking, do I even have the right to eat and drink since nobody's paying any of my bills? I don't have anything. You're complaining about higher prices. I'm asking, where do I even get the food to buy, the, where do I get the money to buy this stuff? There's a little bit of disparity here. You have a right to complain. I have a bigger right to complain. My issue is much more broader than yours. 
That's its challenge here. And he's digging this in a little bit because he says this, why is it I don't have the money to buy food and drink when I want to? Why did that happen? The church is not providing. Now, Paul didn't ask them to, but they all knew all the other apostles got money, so what's the shot he's taking at the Corinthians here? Stop complaining. You, you didn't even offer you didn't even offer. You know the principle for apostles, and you didn't even offer. Yeah, you ever put somebody in the fence by, by getting them on, on something like that, showing a complete failure on their part to support their own attitudes? And I said, you know, you're going to complain. Maybe we should start with this. <clears throat> Shouldn't you have at least offered? I, I might have turned you down. I had a discussion with that. A, a guy, I, I gave some money to help him during a situation, and I didn't expect it back. But he never mentioned it again. And my comment to him is, you know, what I would have preferred was an offer. I would have turned you down, but it would have been nice if you would at least acknowledged. At least acknowledged. There's a, there's a training aspect to this, that people need to understand generosity and what it means. And here's Paul going, you didn't even offer. You didn't even bother to put that in. And he said, by the way, here it is. Don't we have the right to food and drink? And don't we have the right to take a believing wife along with us as do the other apostles and the Lord's brothers and Cephas? He goes this, I'm even cheaper than the other guys. Why? I don't have a wife and family to support. You're not only paying Peter's way, you're paying his wife's way. The apostles are having wives and we're paying their, you're paying their way. I don't have a wife. I'm a bargain. And you're not giving me a dime. You never offered anything. There seems to be a little problem here. Don't we have the right to do that? Piles it on. Verse 6, he really digs it in. Or is it only I and Barnabas who have to work for a living? Why are we so special? Why is it we're the only ones that you've singled out for this unique honor of being ignored? Just, just dripping. Yeah, I, the guy can turn a phrase pretty well. I have to admit, Paul is one of my favorite people for sarcasm. <laughs> Since I like sarcastic humor, I like Paul. He's just my kind of guy. He drives the point home. Just God is pretty well a joke. Oh, God is very good at joke. Yes, I, I will not. I'm talking on the human scale. I'm not trying to have Paul compete with God for sarcasm. Now. <laughs> now, before we go, let me pause and put a couple of things here just to make sure that we also understand some things that are coming out of this passage. One thing I want you to understand here is notice that he makes mention of, don't I have the right to bring a, a bleeding wife along? What is the rule we understand for Christians when it comes to marriage? Equally yoke. Equally yoke. You marry a believer. So Paul making that out. Here's another thing. He is mentioning that all the other apostles, including Jesus' brothers, have wives. Now, do you remember what order claims that they are the apostle, apostolic order being passed from generation to generation? Roman Catholicism says the cardinals are the apostles passing from generation to generation. What are one of the rules and conditions placed on cardinals? You can't be married. Well, wait a minute. Paul is saying the only guy in this group who isn't married is me. I'm the exception. And somehow we make the exception the rule. Cephas had a wife. Now the Catholic Church says no, he doesn't. Yet you can go into Matthew and Mark and find out where Jesus healed Peter's mother-in-law. Now what is a requirement for having a mother-in-law? She <laughs> only identified that way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm just saying here there's there's some clear rules that come across in this and that here's another one it says Jesus's brothers had wives now what does that mention about Joseph and Mary they had more children and the Catholic Church says Mary was a perpetual virgin never had more children well then where did the brothers come from okay there's James and Jude and others that are in there we know that 
So there's some problems here that the text clearly says should not be an issue in the church, just to put that out there. But here's a key principle. Notice that Paul is saying, my status as a servant of God means that the church should be supporting me. There is a standard here that says the job of the church is to support the ministry of those who serve us. We pay their way. We are to make sure they are taken care of. Pastors, missionaries, evangelists, these are people the church should regularly support. Now, I understand there's some problems with that, and people get upset about that. Have there been some men who have abused the role of leader of the church? Just a couple. Okay, there's been a few, haven't there? There's been some con artists out there. I am sorry to say this, but in the course of my life, I've run into at least a dozen pastors who, quite frankly, are only pastors because they never could hold down a real job. And that sounds cold. I'm not saying pastor is not a real job, but they did it because they found out that by being nice and by, by conning people, they could not have to do it in a work with. Now, they tended to jump from church in every two or three years because a man who will not work for God, a man who really not would laboring for Christ, comes out and shows real fast. But at least a dozen guys I know that were in that because they didn't want to try for a job that might require real effort. And they found they could con the church to a certain level. These things certainly do happen. And I'll put it out, it isn't just the church. You go into anything from a nonprofit to charities to anything. Have you noticed a trend of finding out people that run these organizations that turn out to be con artists who are ripping the organization off, claiming they're trying to do good in the community, and it turns out it was all for them? We have a big news story right now. One of the co-founders of Black Lives Matter is facing 20 years for siphoning millions of dollars off from the organization. Only yeah. one black life matters there. So, <laughs> in that particular case, and I'm not trying to single that one out, but it's just big one in the news I'm right now. Saying, I'm going me. Forget the rest. But there's a pattern here. When God said this, He said, "Remember, we were told when. How do we give? Do you remember the pattern that was said in the New Testament? Cheerfully. Cheerfully. That's right. Anything else? Without complaint. Without complaint. That goes to the cheerful. Yeah. With that, and what? Anything else? First fruits. On the first fruits, in other words, we give sacrificially. We don't go, if I have anything left over, I might do it. Okay, those are some principles. What else? We're doing prayerfully. Prayerfully. We're trying to, you know, it's supposed to change the character of your life. Giving, God is helping you grow. What else? Giving. New Testament principles. Privately. Yeah. What's that? Privately. Privately. You don't want everybody else to know how impressive you are in your giving. But here's one that says, lay by in store on the, Anybody? first day of the week why would God say why would he inspire us to say why don't you do this on a regular basis on the first of each week do it first before you do anything else do it first before you do anything else but also try this one that's absolutely true but here's another one when do the needs of most of us come up the needs do we have regularly bills to pay do, do those bills go, oh, well, if you didn't get paid this month, we'll hold it off. But you don't have to worry about it till next month. No big deal. You have any of your creditors offer you that. The electric bill go, don't let it slide. <laughs> Guess what happens? You know what? You know who else's bills need to be paid as regularly as yours? Everybody in the church. The, the servants of the church. And he's saying this. You, you need to see to it that they are regularly supported because they have needs just like you do. they got to buy groceries this week, too. Church has to have that attitude of service to them. Make it a pattern. Make it a pattern to get that done. Paul is laying this out there. So reason number one, Paul says, I'm an apostle. I'm an apostle. That's what you have to understand here. Now a second reason why they should be doing it. Who serves as a soldier at his own expense, who plants a vineyard and does not eat of the grapes, who tends a flock and does not drink of the milk? Now here he goes. Here's the second reason you ought to do it, because it's normal in all of the world for you to benefit from what you do for a living. If you're a soldier, you don't pay your way. I talked to my dad. He was on the, on the D-Day landing. He did not pay for a ticket to cross the channel that day. <laughs> Clothing, food, and transportation was graciously afforded by the United States government for him to go to France for vacation. <laughs> Okay. 
That's not how it works. You pay for that. It is important that they do. How good an army you think you'd have if you expected them to pay their way? We'll show up for the battle just as soon as the rest of them can get their tickets together and earn enough money to show. <laughs> We're trying to get an army out there, but these guys are being lazy. That's not how it works. How much difference do you think the loyalty is of an army that's getting paid by the people they serve? Rome found this out to their chagrin, big mistake. When Julius Caesar crossed the Rubicon and declared himself the master of Rome, he had legions at his back that were savagely loyal to him. You know why? He paid them, he paid them while they were in Gaul conquering. Rome didn't. They refused to pay his legions. So when he showed up at Rome's gates, guess who they were loyal to? Caesar, not Rome. It's a natural thought. Farmers, he go, they, who, does, who doesn't do a farm and eat from their own labor? My grandparents were farmers, and they ate from their own stuff. They did sell in a market, but they brought in from their garden and from their crops, and they made and ate from and benefited from what they did. Isn't it normal to expect that if you do a job, you should get paid for it? Yes. Yes. It's a simple rule. That's what Paul is laying out there. This is something that really works. Then the third principle in verse 8. For it is written in the law of Moses, do not muzzle an ox while it is treading out the grain. Now that's an interesting comment. What does an ox have to do with anything? But he says, first, it's because I'm an apostle. Second, because everybody knows that's how work is supposed to go. And third, because it comes out of the principle of God's word. And God has said this, don't muzzle the ox while it's tre treading the grain. Now, and notice how he says here, he follows that. Is it about oxen that God is concerned? <laughs> you think God said that because he's a, a PETA activist and he wants ethical treatment of animals? Do you think that's what's going on here? Why, why does God say this? Don't muzzle the ox. Now, it came from an old Egyptian saying, actually, that was translated and taken into the Mosaic Law. It was a common phrase. And here's how it worked. You would take a big, flat, packed, compacted place, if you could, a large stone, if possible. If not, compacted earth really hard. And you'd lay the grain out, and you would tie a flat stone off to the back of the oxen, and you'd have it walk back and forth across this, dragging the stone. And that would break the grain free from the chaff. It would separate it out. And they found this. The oxen worked harder if it could, it could eat some of the food. Now, can you imagine how frustrated an oxen would be if he's going back and forth all day, <laughs> close, and there it is right in front of him, and he's got this thing on his back. How long do you think an oxen is going to work for you? Not very long. So he makes this basic rule and says, this just makes sense. You don't do this. The oxen isn't going to perform if you don't let him benefit from the work that he's doing. And he says, God didn't write this for the oxen. The God is not anti-oxen. Don't get me wrong here. <laughs> but the rule here is it about God's people. Surely he says this for us, doesn't he? Yes, he has written it for us because when the plowman plows and the thresher threshes, they ought to do so in the hope of sharing in the harvest. There's an expectation. And God has laid it out there. We should look at that as being the norm. If we have sown spiritual seed among you, is it too much if we reap material harvest from you? It seems crazy that if I'm helping you gain eternal things in your life, that I get some material reward for doing that? I got to work uh, heading up a Christian school for a time. I, I took it on a volunteer basis because they didn't have leadership at the time that told you how desperate they were. They took me. And we just went through this thing. And one of the most shocking things I found out when I ran the school was I got to see this, the salaries <laughs> that churches will pay Christian workers. <laughs> and I was frankly embarrassed to be in charge of that school. <laughs> Looking at that and thinking, and I've had people tell me, well, we don't want to pay them too much, and here's two of the reasons they give me. One, we don't want them to do it for the money. Well, you can accomplish that one, because I'm looking at that salary, and they are not doing it for the money. 
Here's the other one, they said, we want to keep them humble. Now that's an interesting principle. Should I mention that to your boss? Yeah, right. How about if we put that as your standard? They need to keep you as close to poverty as possible so that you will not get proud. Is that how you want to operate in your world? And yet somehow we think that's how we treat Christian workers and we're doing them a favor. Remember that contest about some are worthy of double honor? You know what that passage is talking about? It is not verbal praise. It's money. Take care of your people. I, I'm often amazed by how we deal into that. I've, I've dealt with churches when we were doing pastoral searches, and one of the things they said, well, you know, we can only pay him so much, but if his wife will agree to come in and work in the church often, I go, the principle is, he can bring a believing wife along and she doesn't have to work to make a living. We're hiring him, not her. It is hard at times to get them to understand basic things. You don't treat the people of God that way. The things we'll do sometimes, you know, we'll, well, we'll take care of them. You know, I have some old clothes here I don't need anymore. <laughs> and really, your cast-offs. The car that you've worn out to the point that you don't want to keep it anymore, you're willing to... No, come on. I really just uh, send used tea bags to missionaries in Africa. They, oh, gosh. They're like, Are you <laughs> That's what they used to say. Do years ago. Send used tea bags. Oh, wow. Awkward. Yikes. A servant of God that gives his best to us to receive no less back from us. That's just what I'm putting in here. Is all that oxen that God is concerned? Surely, he says, is for us, doesn't he? Yes, this was written for us because when the plowman plows and the thresher threshes, they ought to do so in the hope of sharing the harvest. If we have sown spiritual seed among you, is it too much to reap a material harvest from it? If others have this right of support from you, shouldn't I have it all the more? Here's what Paul says. You know it's a principle for everybody else, but who's doing the work in your backyard? You are all in favor of it for all the other churches that are supporting their workers, but somehow or other, not for me. Isn't it always easier to encourage other people to do it? <laughs> Ought to give our support. That brings up, you may fit to take care of others this way. So he's saying there's several reasons here. Let me see if I can run that through for you and have a sense of what's going on. He says, it's because I'm an apostle. It's because it's the norm in the world. It's because that's the way God has said it in scripture. It's because it just makes common sense. It's because of a spiritual principle. And now he's gonna put one last thing here. Starting here in verse 12. If others have this right of support, shouldn't we have it all the more? But we did, we did not use this right. On the contrary, we put up with anything rather than handle the gospel of Jesus Christ. Don't you know that those who work in the temple got their food from the temple? Here's another one. He goes, history tells us this. How did the priest get paid in the Old Testament? And they should have known those things. You remember how the priests got paid in the pagan temples they used to work in? Remember how that worked out? You bring the offering, the priest got a third, the person who brought the offering got a third, and a third was burned. Always which third got burned? The worst, the stuff nobody wanted. Well, that's not how God's stuff worked, but try this. They had a burnt offering. The animal was brought in and it was burned whole. All of the animal except one part was kept back. You know what that was? The hide. Guess who got to keep the hide and to sell it to make a living? The priest. They also got a portion of other offerings. The, the sin offering, they got to keep a portion of that. They, the dough offering that was offered, they got to keep a portion of that. They got a part of the tithe given for the Levite offering. They were paid out of a portion of what came into God's house. That was the norm, he's saying. You all know the history. You all know the history, he's saying. Why is it so shocking? Those that work in the temple got their food from the temple, and those who serve the altar share in what was offered to the altar. 
In the same way, the Lord commanded that those who preach the gospel should receive their living from the gospel. And here's the last one. It's a command of our Lord. If you didn't listen to anything else, if you don't care about the history, you don't care about how scripture did it, if you don't care about how it was done for the priest, if you haven't heard it, if you don't care about an apostle, if you don't care about any of that, this one shouldn't matter to you because you're the guys quoting scripture about how it is you shouldn't have to worry about meat sacrificed to idols. I get the understanding you're supposed to care about what God said. But he's saying, do you? Does this really matter to you? Now here's what Paul's going to say. You have the three reasons, I have six. You're sure you're right, so am I. You're saying I shouldn't have to be concerned about the needs of others and put aside what I want to serve them. Let me tell you how I handled it, and I'll tell you next week when we get there. <laughs> Why did Paul ignore his rights? He has listed all these reasons. He's made this case just like they did about the meat sacrifice to idols, and now he's going to say, your challenge was, how can I issue an order I don't live by? Let me tell you what choice I made when it came to my rights, and let's compare notes when we're done.